part 51 this morning we are going to continue our teachings on call to be a champion i have been teaching extensively on nine helpful hints in reading the word of god not too many people understand that there is a specific way in which the word of god is not only read but also approached and these are biblical examples from the word which help us know that god's word ought to be given its rightful place in our lives for example look at what we saw last week the eighth helpful hint in reading the word of god is give the word of god a special gifts to those you love i'm going to repeat again give the word of god a special gifts to those you love nothing is more important than god's word i'm again repeating nothing is more important than god's word remember when god wanted to send somebody to save man he didn't strike upon a good idea to send one of the angels in heaven he decided he would send himself the best part of himself was his word so he said i'll send my word because everything that god is his word is and everything his word is god is so john 3:16 is a verse that lifts us to a new realm of understanding why it's important to gift out the word of god as special gifts to the ones we love now i want you to turn with me please to deuteronomy chapter 6 and we're going to look at verses 4 onwards deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 onwards now this is where we started last week and I'm going to be talking a bit extensively on this so you'll understand why it's important to show people that nothing is more important than God's word. Hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up Now briefly let me stop there before we proceed this morning The Lord our God is one Lord The reason you give importance to God's word is because you have only one Lord You don't have two bosses you can't exist with two bosses You're either hearing from him or you're hearing from the devil. You can simultaneously keep he- hearing from two people and live out your Christian life like most people opt for. No wonder their life is an utter mess. Yesterday I spoke to somebody who was talking to me about a person who I briefly met. And this individual works with him in his office and he said It's a shame because this man was saying God is in a mess. He's saying he's talking filth today. He's talking about perverse things, profane things, and as part of his conversation, he's all the time saying God is in a mess. So I've started telling him no, God is never in a mess. Is either you are in a mess or I'm in a mess, but not God. Now, let's look at that statement God is in a mess. who's given him that revelation surely not a god who's in a mess so this individual is hearing from someone else but the person is a church goer the person claims to be somebody in the church where he attends but sometimes professionalism makes people expose their foolishness it 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 shouldn't be the case but that's what happens most times because after a point when people rise to a particular place they begin to think that god is in a mess that they know more than god and it's a sad thing because companies depend on such men to be in leadership positions and it's terrible because if you think god is in a mess and you're heading the show you'll take the entire company down the drain if you're not removed from that place of position sooner or later now follow very carefully The Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. So the command to love 
is foremost even in the Old Testament. Why do I give first place to God's word? Because I love it, period. Not because I'm forced to accept it. I don't read the word of God because I think something is going to happen during the day. No, I read the word of God because it's God's love letter to me. And I love to hear from him. I long to hear from him. His word is my delight. So I increase my time that I spend with his word. So how do I love him? With all thine heart. With all thy soul. And with all thy might. Three areas are mentioned there. So if you thought 1 Thessalonians was the only place which spoke about man being spirit, soul and body, you are wrong. The concept of man being spirit, soul, body is spread all over the Bible. And it is found here. You love the Lord your God with all your heart. Number one, your spirit. Number two, your soul, your mind. And all your physical might. So your body. So you see how God's word takes first place in three areas. Can I have an amen please? Three areas. He is not the God of just one area. Some people make him the God of only one area. They say he is the Lord in my spirit. But then my soul is free to do what it wants. And of course my body is also mine. I can do what I like to do. No. He is the Lord of your spirit, soul and body. And when you love him in all the three areas of your life, you begin to see a manifestation of his glory in all these three areas. Now look at verse 6 please. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Mark that scripture down please. He didn't say, let these words be in the book. Can I have an amen? He didn't say let the words be in the book. He said let the word be in your heart. Now from your heart, the words proceed out. How do the words proceed is the question. They proceed as something that you steadily apply yourself to. That's the word diligence. I want you to write these things down. The word diligence is not an ordinary word. Diligence is not once a week. Diligence is not once a month. Diligence is not once in six months. Diligence is an everyday walk with God. You're either diligent or you're not diligent. Now, how do you teach your children? Diligently. How can you be diligent in teaching it to your children? Because the word is in your heart. It's not in the book. Often people have the word in the book. It's not in their heart. The moment they speak from their heart, it is, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? And over and over again, you hear counsel that never lines up with the word coming from people's mouths. That's what they're teaching. And you can't blame them because they don't have the word in their heart. So whatever is in their heart, that's what their mouth keeps mouthing all the time. But if the word is in your heart, then when you speak to your children, it's amazing because I was meditating on this word. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Thou shalt talk of them. Talk of who? The word. Today we are not hearing that. We are hearing a different form of conversation. Just yesterday my wife was talking to me about a particular individual who's mouthing sickness and disease all the time in the place where she works and this is the most amazing thing she's saying even unbelievers are not saying it they don't their talk about sickness and disease a lot but here's this so-called believer all the time speaking nonsense all the time each word which comes out highlights sickness highlights disease now what do you teach talk to the children about you talk of them you talk of the word which is in your heart. And you do it diligently. You steadily apply yourself every day to find a way in which you communicate to your children the word of God. How? And where? And when? Most people, I mean this verse will demolish a lot of people's talk. Lukewarm people always tend to look at things through 
shady glasses. Everything they talk is shaded. Follow. This one verse will demolish every statement that people make saying, I'm just waiting for that day and that time when I'll talk to my child about Jesus. There is no waiting for the day and the time. Look at that verse. You shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. That means while you're just sitting and relaxing, you're on the veranda. Just speak the word out. You're in your sitting room. Speak the word out. You're sitting on your bed and your child is in the room. Speak the word out. I know your people, not a convinced amen. When you're seated in your house, next verse. When thou walkest by the way, that means you're talking and conversing like the two disciples were conversing on the road to Emmaus. They were speaking about the strange things that had taken place. Hallelujah! No wonder Jesus felt comfortable in their presence. You heard our brother speak a little earlier about how a water lorry nearly sent us to glory land. I mean, we heard the chariot. All right. Only our time hadn't come. It was this close. I said it was this close. I don't like exaggerating from the pulpit, but it was this close. The Shire Otter fellow, he didn't want us to move actually. He wanted us to be pushed to the left. Pushed to the right, sorry. So he came straight at us and he was pulling the steering wheel. We could see him doing everything and pushing us to the other side. And here was this guy hurtling past. Not stopped even a single minute. Listen, when you're speaking about him in the way, it really doesn't matter. Because then you begin to see his protection, his covering, his goodness, his mercy, his love. Everything is so different after that point. There is a difference. And it's never going to be the same after that because the word is the one which you're talking about in the way. What do we sit and talk when we go together on the bike? The word. How can we spend time with the Lord? How can we give the word out? What kind of a strategy we can adopt? What should we do? One day is not good enough. Let's have two or three days more of waiting upon the Lord. That's what we are doing all the time here. So by the way, when you're walking by the way, it is not anything else. You're not looking and saying, oh, see that poster. Maybe I should go and watch that movie. You know what you're talking about. There's something that's dominating your conversation, by the way. Now please, highlight this. There are four things mentioned there. And I want to give it to you just clearly. When the walkest by the way, you're speaking the word. And when the liest down, you're speaking the word. My friends, you can't have a fight in bed. If your word that you speak is not a word that is harsh, you're mouthing the word. How do I go to sleep mouthing scripture? That's how I go to sleep and I sleep well. I mean by the time I close my eyes, I don't have this long hours of waiting, waiting, waiting to sleep. No, by the time I finish Psalm 23, I'm off. I'm off, I'm sleeping. Speak the word. Mouth the word when thou liest down. Let your children hear it. I remember growing up in my house not knowing the Lord. But I can't forget the days when I would hear my parents getting up early in the morning and my mother lifting up her voice and shouting, Praise you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now this is quite early in the morning. That's not the time a backslidden person like me or a person who has no relationship like me would like to hear, bless the Lord, oh my soul. You're trying to say, Lord, tell her to keep quiet. But nowadays when I get up in the morning, I speak the same word out. I bless the Lord early. I get up with praise you, Jesus. Even the worst of times, that's the word that comes out of my mouth. The worst of times. And I've seen a lot of worst of times in my life, you know, happen now and then. I get up with praise and worship because what you see, you learn, my friends. And what you hear from what your parents do matters. 
Last week I had to speak to someone. And this is exactly what I told that individual. Don't play church. Now that's not what, what the person liked to hear or wanted to hear. Because they're playing church. You don't play church. Children watch you. You can't fault children. Children learn very well. And today's children are real smart. They know whether you are praising the Lord or they know whether you are cursing the Lord. They know body language so well. They know verbal communication also so well. How do you get up in the morning? How do you go to sleep matters? How do you get up matters? When thou liest down, let your children diligently hear the word in your lips. Don't let the last thing you say be the word that doesn't line up with the word. <laughs> Four, when thou risest up. Now you can't get up with praise and worship in the morning if the last word on your lips was, Ayo. I don't know why I went through one day. How will you get up in the morning with praise and worship? You're cursing the next day when you get up as well. You don't like the day. You're wishing like this writer of the book of Deuteronomy said in chapter 28. You will get up, you know, with a curse on your lips. And you'll wish why the day started for you. And then when the night comes, you'll be wishing when will the night get over? When will the next day come? Why? Because your entire life is following a curse. Never follow a curse. You want to see how a curse comes into a house? Look at a person's speech. And it can happen to any individual. Nobody is exempted in the body of Christ. Nobody. The other day we had gone to attend a wedding. And there the pastor was standing on the stage and he said, What shook me was my own son in, my, in his wedding didn't sing. So he asked the couple who were there on the stage, Are you concentrating and staying focused? Now that's a good preacher. I said, that's a good preacher. He said, it shook me that to see my son on, on his wedding day, he doesn't want to praise the Lord. He's getting caught up with the marriage day. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to get, up, get so caught up with the marriage day that you forget the living God who's making the marriage possible, who's honoring the marriage. So there's no exemptions, whether you're laity or clergy. Remember, this word is for every man. So how do you have the word in your heart? You meditate on the word day and night, not just say, oh, I, may, I said it already. Now it's over. Now I can say what I like. No, this is God. He'll demolish every kind of you know, speech that contradicts this verse. This verse is powerful. So when you're in the car or on, your, on the motorcycle or you're just traveling by walk, you can speak the word out. You can focus on speaking the word. That way your journey is pleasant. That way you have less controversies. That way you're not gossiping. That way you're not gossiping. You can't gossip with the word. You're speaking the word. There's less of pain, more of joy. That's what our sister testified. Now I'm delivered. So much joy. Hallelujah, so much joy. Who gave joy? The one who is joy. Can I have an amen please? So when you speak his word, continually. Now this is a continual work not six months then all of a sudden some calamity and then you're sitting and speaking something else something's wrong with you this is done diligently before children and children learn from what they see if they see wrong they'll practice wrong if they say right they'll go for the right it may take time but they'll go for the right now look at verse 8 9 10 Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets before thine eyes. Now literally, the Jews do it. But what it's really speaking about goes further than just a literal binding something on your hand. I can bind a lot of things on my hand. But if my hands are not used right, like the word wants it, then there's no use in me just hanging something on my hand. How many people tattoo Jesus? On their, you know, forearms. And then walk around with a cigarette in their hand as well. No use with the tattoo. I said no use with the tattoo. Can I have a church that's responding this morning? There's no use with the tattoo. The tattoo says Jesus, but the hand is used for something else. Now listen, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. That means in your 
hand. There is the word that directs the hand to do something. You put your hand to the plow. Remember the word which says, don't take your hand from the plow. Keep plowing. Keep plowing. You're setting your hands to do some work. Remember, he blesses the labor of my hands. Not, will God do something for me? He blesses the labor of my hands. Then, in a worship service, when you come in like this, and you hear somebody say, let's lift up hands to the Lord, you immediately say, well, I'm lifting up holy hands to the Lord. It doesn't matter whether my hands are calloused. It doesn't matter whether my hands look good and pretty. But one thing I know, when it's raised up in praise and worship, it is holy hands. It is a sign to me. The word is a sign to me. The word is a sign to me. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. That means I'll keep my eye right. So that entry of wrong is kept away. Can I have an amen please? Entry of wrong is kept away. Why? Because the word is there as a barrier. The word is there as a barrier. The word helps me. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Now nothing wrong in doing it. If you want to do it, you are free to do it. But then you must understand that the same word is written even on graveyards. So it's not just talking about literally writing the word. It goes beyond it. Your house is standing because of the word. Entry of things into your house is permitted and kept out by the word. Now that's far better than just having a wall hanging in the house and just under the wall hanging all kinds of literature. That's perversion. Now that's what happens in most houses and people don't even know what's happening in houses. They'll have the wall hanging in the house. The Lord is the head of this house. Silent listener to every conversation. He's here, present. And everything there is not godly. Everything there is ungodly. And it's terrible because people are literally doing the thing that the word says. Nothing wrong in literally fulfilling it. If you like to paint the word in your house, you're most welcome to do it. But then more than that, you've got to understand your house is standing because of the word. Now, let's keep reading. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, most people belch. And the belch is a perversion in the sight of God. Because that belch is a belch of self-pride. I did it. I got it. It's mine. I work so hard, God never features in their life at all. God is not a part of the household at all. Nobody wants him any longer. He is not a part of the celebration. There is a birthday function, God is not honored. Everybody wants to cut the cake. My friend, the cake will land you in a mess if the blessing is not around. Because the blesser is ignored. How many people cut the cake and never can eat the cake? Others sit and eat the cake. If you are having the blessing, you'll have the cake and you'll eat it. You'll have the cake and you'll eat it. And I'm not joking. I've gone into houses. I mean, they call me to come. And sometimes the celebration of the presence of the blesser is the least in the celebration. It's a curse. It's a curse. People are more interested in singing happy birthday. They don't know every happy birthday is a warning to the man whom they are singing. You are coming closer to the time you have to go there. And I am quoting from Dr. Akbar Huck. He said sometimes people when somebody dies are so shocked. They sit and cry. And I asked them only one question. And he's the co-evangelist of Dr. Billy Graham. He says I asked them one question. Didn't you realize it when you were singing happy birthday? Can I have an amen please? Don't get frightened. We are not frightened of getting to heaven. The one who are frightened of getting to heaven don't have a relationship with God. They are the ones who are frightened. Not us. Not us. 
Heaven is a beautiful place. And it's terrible because in celebrations, this is what happens. And I'll have people come up to me while they're gossiping, while they're talking, they were talking hours on end. Hours on end, they want to sit and speak over, you know, loads and loads of food. For which afterward they have to eat so many tablets to get digested. But then they'll come to me and tell me, please see to it that the word is just spoken for five minutes or ten minutes. Or some will go one step ahead. They'll say, you're a wise man. I know, you know. I know, you know. <laughs> they don't know about what I know. They don't know. Because I'm not really interested in sometimes going back to such places. So I'll preach sometimes for one hour. That's what they don't know. I know you know. Someone said the other day, I know you know how to adjust. And it's terrible. Because if I really adjust, they will stay adjusted all their life. I'm one person who don't look at face. I don't preach for any man's face. Sorry. 21 years ago, I was ready to go. God spared my life. He gave me 21 years. So these years are years of bonus and blessing. I don't look at any man's face and preach. But that's what most people do. It's just that I've mellowed down a little bit. <laughs> so I sit and smile. But they don't know what I know. They really don't know what I know. Because this is what people do. They ignore God. They ignore the blesser. Then they want to know why is that family blessed? Why are they having something? Find out! How much of the blesser is there in your house? How much of the blesser is honored every day? What kind of a celebration of praise you have, you know ordered for whatever you're trying to do whether it's your dedication of your house or a birthday celebration or an anniversary celebration how much of the blesser is honored find out one family that i went and visited one time small little baby not too far from this place the parents were so caught up with greeting people and blowing balloons that they forgot that the reason I was called was to speak and to pray for the child. And finally, they served dinner. And as I was leaving and going to the lift, because I don't force prayer on anybody. As I'm going to the lift, the lady of the house looks and says, Oh my God, we didn't pray. So this verse is no joke. I said, this verse is no joke. This verse will someday try us. Don't say it's Old Testament. I'm living in New Testament days. We are living with the one who never changes. He doesn't change his word for each season. His word remains the same. Can I have an amen please? Then beware. Look at verse 12. Lest thou forget the Lord. That means forgetfulness is a curse in the people of God's lives. It's a very serious sin. Forgetfulness. Because now they're enjoying material prosperity. When material prosperity comes, forgetfulness is one of the major sins that raises its ugly head. Forgetfulness. Forget who? The Lord. The one who gave the word. Who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. Now you heard our brother pray a little earlier. I don't hear people this morning. Some of you didn't hear him pray. But what did he pray? It was the blood that brought us out of Egypt. How did he know what I'm going to preach this morning? God the Spirit knew. But when you spend time with God, he will show you. He will show you exactly where you were and from where he brought you out. Remember what? He brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. He brought you out of sin. And if that is not cause for you to give him thanks, then I don't know what else is. It's not money. The very fact that I was once a sinner but now I'm a saint is cause for me to rejoice every day and bless his name. Every day. He brought you out of the land of Egypt. From the house of bondage. Now I want you to circle that word or the phrase house of bondage. That means while you were in the land of Egypt, how were you? A slave. A bondman. Sold into slavery. That means there was a price that was so hard for you to pay personally that you couldn't pay for your freedom. 
I want you to understand this phrase well. Write it down, please. There was a price while you were in the house of bondage for your freedom, but you and I could never pay it. So we were hopelessly slaves to sin and to Satan. No wonder he can't stand our success this morning. No wonder he can't stand our praise and worship this morning. No wonder he can't stand the joy we have this morning. No wonder he can't stand the good success we have and enjoy this morning. So what does he do? Slander. Through who? Lukewarm people. You'll never find a man who's on fire for the Lord slandering. Because he doesn't have time to slander. He doesn't have time to slander. He's busy with the work of God. You look at somebody who slanders, he has time on his hands to slander. Why? Because God is not on his thoughts. Someone else is on his thoughts. Something else is on his thoughts. Somebody else is on his thoughts. So he has time on his hands to slander. Follow very carefully. The house of bondage. That means we were servants in a house. But not enjoying... A status that we had to enjoy. We were slaves. Now we are sons. We are not in the house of bondage. We are living in the house of God. Can I have an amen please? We had sons and daughters. We are not slaves. We are not slaves. So this is what we remember all the time. Whether we have money or we don't have money. We keep remembering this. We don't forget. Forgetfulness is a crime in the kingdom. Can I have an amen brother? Forgetfulness is a crime in the kingdom. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Highlight that verse please. What is the meaning of this verse? Is it talking about the perverse way in which people say, when they do something wrong, I swear upon God, I didn't do this. No, 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 no. It's not talking about that. It's talking about every conversation we have, which is a conversation that becomes an oath, is done in His name. That means we have one person who we know is continually watching us, the living God. We don't fool Him. He can never be fooled. He knows us exactly always and at all times let's read verse 14 please you shall not go after other gods or the gods of the people which are round about you that's important as well don't go after other gods now this is not just talking about idolatry this is talking about anyone or anything getting precedence over the living god in your life anyone or anything sometimes it is an acquired god because you find the peer pressure being put on you by people who are already existing in a place so you start going after their gods you adopt their fashions you adopt their ideas which most times are not biblical for example partying Let's go to the party. Now I'm not talking about a party where you know God is being exalted and worshipped. I'm talking about the wrong kind of one. Where somebody will look at you and say, well, let's just go and unwind. And you say, what do you mean? And he says, well, you know what we do on weekends? We just go to this place and it's a good disco. We'll just go and have a good time there. Let's go. After all, all of us go. Do you know your boss also comes there? And immediately there is subtle pressure being put on your mind to serve another God. Don't ever think it's just talking about idolatry alone. Most people will never bring an idol into the house, but they have a lot of other acquired gods. Acquired gods. And these acquired gods rule and reign. Nobody becomes an alcoholic first day. It starts off with social drinking. In fact, if you will go to a rehab center where alcoholics are dealt with you will see how step by step the three major steps are highlighted of a way in which a man becomes an alcoholic first a man takes a drink then a drink takes a drink and then finally the drink takes the man you look at social drinkers they always say well we are in control we just drink you know once in a way 
after a point of time when there is pressure subtle pressure and that god of drink knows he is now ripe for the picking i'll just put a little pressure then you'll find this person disappearing and now he just wants to go and buy a small bottle remember our first place in which we started our church this ministry this church was over a wine shop i have seen a lot of people who come alcoholics early in the morning who will surprise you they are decent men going for work decent sales people sometimes decent girls women some of them will come in auto rickshaws four or five of them one will come the bold one in the lot and she'll stand there and you know in a brazen way ask for two three bottles they'll grab it put it inside take off that's what god is warning us about don't follow the gods of the people which are around about you that means if you're serving the lord see that the company you keep also serve the lord you serve i have friends i have acquaintances people who i have known over the years but i'll never call a person a friend who's not serving the lord i serve i may just say i know the person i will not spend a majority of my time with such an individual every week his lord cannot be my lord either my lord must be his lord or else his lord will never be my lord now this is a warning please listen don't think oh pastor is going overboard in teaching this i'm not going overboard you got to know about this if this was not an important requirement in our life god would never have spoken this word i said god would never have spoken this word if he is taken care to speak this word to us then this is something that is a very definite warning like you heard a little earlier for some people their gods are sickness and disease some of their gods even go by names to which very definite sicknesses are related to can i have an amen don't act like you don't know what i'm talking about their gods go by the names of the sickness and the disease so when you walk and you talk and interact with people don't go after other gods the man who goes after other gods doesn't know that the first step took place when he forgot the lord his god that means if you never spend time in deuteronomy chapter 28 you never spend time finding out that jehovah is our healer you are sooner or later going to acknowledge something or someone else as capable of doing something I want you to mark this down. I'm going to give you an example, and this is an example that shook the person who was involved in what I'm talking about. Many years ago, I knew a person who was serving the Lord in ministry, and he comes from a family of people who serve the Lord in ministry. But there was this day when his wife, you know, stayed back, and she was staying back quite some time without listening to the word. Remember, subtle pressure comes. at the time when you least expect it it never comes when you expect it because if it came when you expect it you'll know what to do now he was with me in an evening service listen very carefully when his wife was at home and she was at home because he said the child was sick now there are they were staying in a place where every one of the neighbors were unbelievers and they loved this lady a lot they would call her akka and come and stand and help and i mean the whole works now it so happened that the sickness was prolonging for a couple of days 3 4 days so i don't know what the lady said while her husband was in evening service with me but one of the neighbors came out with a bright idea why don't you take a little bit of black mai what you put for your eyelashes okay you darken your eyelashes why don't you just apply it on your child's cheek i am sure this child is sick because someone cast eyes on the healthy child the service was over the man went back home when i got a call and he was so disturbed he said my god 
I said, I don't know what happened. I asked, what happened? He said, my wife did the most unthinkable thing. I asked, what did she do? She listened to somebody and applied my. Now this is a person in ministry's wife. Don't give this word second place, please. It can happen to anybody. Don't think it happens only to people who don't know the Lord. It happens to people in the church. This verse is powerful. I can relate to this verse. So she has applied. So when he went home, he saw a big application of that, you know, eye salve on her, on the child's cheek. And he looked and he was wondering, he asked her what happened. And then she said, you know, the neighbor said it is like this. So I just applied it. There was no remorse. Because urgency to get the child healed went beyond the word. This is not a joke. I'm not joking when I preach. I've been through certain things that not too many of you will see in ministry. So when I talk, I know what I'm talking. You look at people who backslide. They are people who constantly break hearing the word. They don't hear the word. The word means nothing to them. So over a period of time, the application is made and at the most vulnerable time the one goes after the other gods they had to repent and there was a lot of crying and you know feeling bad and so many things another you know thing about this is there was one person individual who was in the entertainment business off and on she used to worship here yeah. so I used to tell her see if you're coming why don't you come regularly and hear the word you're in a place where entertainment is so high and you know they'll make you do sometimes things that you don't like to do so this individual looked at me and said you don't know what you're saying I'm so tired I can't come to church so I said okay I kept quiet one Sunday morning after service was over this person stayed back and said I want to talk to you she so said okay stood pa stayed back with that person then she started to weep uncontrollably I asked what happened she said, I never, never in my entire acting career have gone before an idol and worshipped like this. But just last week, all of a sudden, suddenly the director brought an idol and said, just go around it once and go. And it was done so suddenly, I just did it. And I'm feeling bad about it. Don't forget it's not an ordinary verse, please. Don't think it's for the preacher alone. It's for everybody. You forget him, you're on your own. Because sooner or later, another God begins to dominate your life. This verse is powerful. That's why I said I'm going to speak a little extensively on this. Because this is how you understand and relate to the love letter that God's given you. I mean, he's a jealous God. He's your eternal lover. He's talking about his love to you. He is wanting your response. You better give him your full-hearted response. Hallelujah. It's either he is your lover or somebody else is your lover. When you read the Old Testament, one thing you can't fail to... Re you, I mean, you know, sense the pathos in God's voice when he speaks about Israel. He said, I loved Israel. But see, Israel, Israel is running after someone else. Sometimes people think it's vulgar language. It's not vulgar language. It's a language that is vulgar by itself. Because of the act of man. Not because of God. God is speaking it in the most highest fashion. But he says, you see Israel? Israel is running after somebody else. Israel loves many lovers. Sometimes it looks a little bit vulgar. But if you understand, the vulgarity is not in the language. The vulgarity is in the heart of the man. He is a vulgar because he has already erected a different God in his heart. And God is pained. Our eternal lover is pained. It pains him terribly. Read the book of Hosea. I mean people who wonder whether God is a God of love in the Old Testament. And they come to the conclusion, no, God is an angry God in the Old Testament and he is only a God of love in the New Testament. I have never read the book of Hosea. You read the book of Hosea, you will weep if you read it the right way. It's a good book to read when you are fasting and praying. You will see the heart of the Father in that verse, in that book. <laughs> I mean, he loves so much. So much that he would make a prophet do the unthinkable. Go and marry a prostitute. 
Some of you are wondering whether this book is there in the Bible. You better find out. Read the book. Spend time with God. Find out about his heart. He wants a heart relationship. Not this kind of, a, you know, where you come to you know, impress people and just go back and then you're on your own and after that you're just doing your own stuff. No, he's not bothered about that. And this is what increasingly the, the Lord is speaking to me about. I've increased my time of waiting upon him and my staff as well. Because there is no long-lasting blessing that we will get if the blesser is ignored. No long-lasting blessing. So if you are trying to reach me, you better find out whether you first reached him. We had our testimony a little earlier. <laughs> Before you see the face of Samson, find out whether you have seen the face of God. It's not that we don't, you know, respect people in the medical profession, no. It's not that. But even for simple things, you must understand one thing. First have I sought the face of the master. First have I sought him out. Have I found him? Have I waited daily at his gates? If you have, he'll tell you what to do. Sometimes he'll tell you, no, I'll heal you just the way you are. Sometimes he'll tell you, go to someone, he'll help you. We must have enough sense of humility in our hearts to listen to the voice of wisdom. But he will speak, he will direct. He will guide. He will show. So there's no really, no, this man will be exempted, that person will be, no, 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 no. God wants to see what's on your heart. What's on your heart? You got to check out what's on your heart all the time. There will be a lot of people who are going to be in heaven who the world thought won't enter heaven. <laughs> there's a lot of other people who are going to be in the wrong place who many thought will be in heaven. I mean, the ones who thought this man is getting to heaven. Is going to be, uh, they're going to be a lot, you know, discouraged when they get to heaven. There's going to be a lot of weeping. And sometimes even gnashing of teeth. Because the ones who they thought will get to heaven are not there. The ones who they least expected to go are there. Why? Because in the heart of that man, their love for the Savior was unmatched. The love for their master was unmatched. Their confession of the God whom they loved and served was unmatched. So please, we're going to stop with this place for now. Because we have another service to, you know, conduct a little later. Our water baptism service. But I want you to, please, mark the scripture down, verse 14. We'll continue from verse 15 next week. Come next week. Listen to the word. Give first place to the God you love and serve. He is not in a mess. In fact, if he is honored, he'll turn your mess around and make it your message. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We are in one spirit, O oh God, this morning. We are of one mind. And we see ourselves the way you see us. Joseph was sent into Egypt for one purpose. To prepare the land. But more importantly. To make provision. For the 70 who would enter into the land of Egypt. From whom a nation called Israel would come out from. Precious father. As I am lifting up these Tamil newsletters. Oh father. I am commanding your anointing upon every word. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The new ground will be broken. New areas will be opened up. The word will go forth. As our Hindi CDs go out, O oh Father. Let there be a tremendous release of an anointing, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus. More recordings are on. We commend your blessing. Your favor. Your anointing. In the name of Jesus. The lie of the devil will never prevail. Your word will prevail. You will not become a liar, O oh Father. Everyone in Joseph's household looked at Joseph with disdain and called him, the dreamer is coming. Let's do away with him. You thought differently, O oh Father. You didn't call him a dreamer. You went one step beyond. Interpreter of dreams. Hallelujah! Into every nation. 
every tribe, every people. Let this word go forth, O Father. Let it go forth, O Lord. In every language. In every language. In every language. In every language. Let the word go forth. Let it go forth anointed to bring forth fruit that may remain. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We respect you, God the Holy Spirit. Yes, we, you, God, the Holy we honor you, God the Holy yes, Spirit. You, God, the Holy You're not just some spirit. You're God the Holy, God, spirit. The Holy spirit. You are God. Co-eternal with the Father. Co-eternal with the Son. Co-substantial with the Father. Co-substantial with the Son. Amen. And we love you. We respect you. Yes, we we honor you. Yes, we honor oh, we honor you, yes, O Lord. We honor you. We honor you. Yes, Great is thy faithfulness. Blessed Amen. be your holy name. Yes, I send forth your people, O oh God, who are here this morning with your joy in their hearts and with the blood of the covenant upon them. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. This concludes Pastor Isaac's message.